Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Ashley Leonard, the Associate Director of the Two and Through Middle Grades Network. And I am thrilled that you have joined us today for the release of our latest research brief and tool focused on elementary on track. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, the To and Through Project strives to create equitable education outcomes for Chicago public school students by helping educators use data for inquiry and action. We work closely with the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research to develop research and tools like you're gonna be um, seeing today um, to support students from the middle grades all the way through post-secondary. I am particularly excited about today's webinar because the idea for this research was prompted by the work we do in the middle grades network to support CPS educators in improving outcomes and experiences for middle grade students. We currently work with 14 incredible CPS schools across the city and their commitment to creating environments where middle school students thrive now and in the future is what drives the work we do in MGN. This research and tool has already proved really useful and powerful for our schools. And I'm really excited and hopeful that it will do the same for you in your work. Before we get started today, um, I'm just going to run through a couple of our upcoming events um, that we have coming up at two and through. First, we have our um, tool released today. So you'll hear shortly from my colleagues, Alexandra Usher and Thomas Mason, who will talk more about the research and the tools um, today. Then on November 10th, we'll actually get another opportunity to feature some of the work um, related to the Middle Grades Network, where um, our colleagues from Brighton Park and Columbia Explorers Elementary Schools will talk about how they use some student data um, to support meaningful work. Then on December 1st, we have a couple of folks um, coming to talk about centering equity and organizational change, Jackie Lemon and Rito Martinez. Um, and I think this will be a really um, important and insightful conversation given kind of the state of the world today and how a lot of organizations um, are trying to really focus on this work right now. And finally, um, on December 6th, our last session before the holidays, we um, will have our very own Alex Seaskin talking about how Chicago school high school should become less selective um, instead of more. So a lot of good things on the horizon um, for us here at Two and Through and a lots of, lot of exciting events for you to join us and learn more about what's going on in the world um, of education today. Before I introduce um, our speakers today, a couple of quick reminders. This is a webinar format. So if you have questions throughout, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to share those questions. We will leave time to get to those at the end of the discussion today. And then we will also be op offering an optional space afterwards to discuss what you've heard today. We've gotten a lot of feedback as we've done these webinars over the last couple of years that it's really nice to have space to process what folks just heard and a lot of this new research. So we will be sending some information about that closer to the end of the session today. All right, so now I'm going to um, introduce our first presenter, Alexandra Usher. Um, Alexandra is the Associate Director of the Two and Three Project and a Senior Research Analyst at the Consortium on School Research. Alexandra leads the research and data processes that inform the Two and Three Project, which aims to increase high school and post-secondary completion for under-resourced students of color in Chicago, and to share the learning with education stakeholders both in Chicago and across the country. Prior to her time at Two and Through, Alexandra led the data strategy team for the AUSL Network of Schools. And prior to that, she spent time at Chicago Public Schools and the Center for Education Policy. She holds a BA from George, George Washington University and an MPP from the University of Chicago Harris and is an Education Pioneers and Fulbright alumna. She's also celebrating her little one's first birthday today. So also wanna give Teddy Usher a shout out on his birthday as well. Welcome, Alex. Our second presenter is Thomas Mason. Thomas is currently a master's student in clinical psychology at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. His research focuses on developing tools for digital mental health interventions. 
and his interests include human-centered design and mental health interventions and health equity. Tom has previously worked as a research analyst um, at the University of Chicago Urban Education Institute, where he created actionable indicators of academic success for middle grade students and developed online data tools to facilitate access to academic achievement data for Chicago elementary schools. Prior to that, Thomas obtained his BS in industrial engineering from Northwestern University. Please help me welcome Thomas. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Alex and Thomas to get us going on the research presentation. Ashley. All right, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this rainy Tuesday. Um, I am Alex Usher and I'm gonna be walking you all through the um, research report that we're releasing today, our elementary on track report. So just to jump into a quick uh, overview of the agenda for the day. So I'll start by, um, by previewing the research report and telling you some of the key findings and takeaways. Um, then I'll kick it over to Thomas, my co-presenter, who is gonna show you a demo of our online tool that we also released today. Um, we'll have some time for questions. And then I really hope you all will stick around for the um, post-event discussion. It's um, like Ashley said, just a chance to chat and process um, what we heard. It's really informal. Um, so hope you all can join us for that. All right, jumping right into an overview of today's research. So we are really excited today to release our report, um, Elementary on Track, Elementary School Students' Grades, Attendance, and Future Outcomes. Um, so this report is the culmination of several years of work by our team, including um, Thomas, who was the lead analyst and is co-presenting with me today. Um, I'll take you through the main findings and the key takeaways in the report. But before I do that, I wanna step back for a minute and just um, look at where we started and how we got here. So taking a little trip back through time, um, almost 10 years ago now, our sister organization that Ashley mentioned, the UChicago Consortium on Schools Research, um, released this report called Looking Forward to High School and College, Middle Grades Indicators of Readiness in Chicago Public Schools. And this report, um, the researchers tried to determine what were the best indicators in the elementary grades of students' future academic success? So they looked at all different um, student characteristics. They looked at test scores, at grades, attendance, um, even things like students' demographics, where they live. They looked at the full picture of data. Um, and what they actually found was most important was this connection between high grades and high attendance in the middle grades and strong academic outcomes in high school and readiness for post-secondary work. So really when they looked at the full spectrum of things, what it boiled down to was most important um, as indicators in those early years was attendance and grades. And so we set out a few years ago to do a couple of things um, to refresh that original research. We wanted to look at it with new data, um, see if those patterns still held. And then also to ask ourselves, again, the similar question for students in the middle grades, what are the best indicators of future academic success? Um, so I'll get in a little while to how exactly we conducted that research, but ultimately after looking at the data, analyzing it many different ways, um, we sort of came to the same conclusion that students' GPAs and attendance in the middle grades are still the best indicators of their future academic success. Um, so while most of the rest of today's presentation is gonna focus on these two metrics of, of GPA and attendance, I do wanna recognize that grades and attendance um, are imperfect. They don't, they're incomplete measures. They only tell us part of the story of what's going on with students and students' experiences and their voices should also really be centered and considered as key data in any discussions around strategy or intervention. Um, the other thing I wanna do before moving on is set some context about what else was going on in the space when we were doing our research. Um, so most importantly, Chicago Public Schools has actually been using an elementary indicator system for some time. Um, before 2018, the district had a simpler indicator that basically just looked at whether a student was on track or off track based on whether they had a 95% attendance rate and at least a C in math and reading. Um, their learnings from using that indicator, that sort of yes, no, on track, off track, led them to develop a more nuanced system of elementary on track, which is what we're looking at on the screen now. So this was unveiled in, I believe, 2018, um, this more formal EOT indicator. Um, and it uses, so this is for grades three through eight, 
You can see here it uses a student's attendance and their GPA to place them into one of five different levels of on track um, between on track and off track. And this indicator um, became part of the district's accountability system actually in 2019, although that accountability system was um, soon suspended during COVID. And so while this is really widespread throughout the district, it never was, um, I don't believe ever used in school ratings. Um, there are definitely a lot of benefits to this metric. The five categories make it more precise than um, that simple on-track, off-track designation. Um, it has potential to help educators and students really chart improvement trajectories. And one really nice thing about the five levels is that it prevents schools from focusing on those, what we sometimes call those bubble students who are sitting like just below an indicator um, threshold. And, and so this with the five um, different categories sort of prevents that. Um, we also see it's really strongly correlated with students' later academic outcomes. So what we're looking at here is the five different um, elementary on-track categories used by CPS and um, the associated rates of high school graduation, which is what the full bar is showing you, and then graduating with a 3.0 GPA, which is what that darker red portion is showing. So we can see that as students move through those on-track categories from off-track to on-track, their rates of graduating from high school also go up. Um, and students in the on-track category graduated from high school actually at almost three times the rate of students who are off-track and were at least twice as likely to graduate with a 3.0 GPA than their peers in any of the other categories. So we see really strong associations there. Um, this next slide is basically the same graph, but now instead of looking at high school graduation, we're looking at the outcome of students enrolling immediately into college after graduating high school. So again, we see that students in the on-track category enrolled in college at over five times the rate of students who were off track. Um, students in the on-track category were twice as likely to enroll into a four-year college than their peers in any of the other categories. Um, so all that is to say that we do see later academic outcomes are very closely correlated with the on-track group that students were in in the middle grades, according to these the CPS metric. So we knew from our initial research and all this analysis we did of the data that GPA and attendance continued to be the most important indicators in those middle grades years. So the next question we asked ourselves was, can we boil this down to something that's really simple, um, something really easy to remember, easy to visualize, um, could be applied outside of the Chicago context. Um, and while the CPS grid is really nuanced, we wanted to try to create something a bit more high level. So we looked at these patterns of attendance, grades, and GPA for cohorts of middle grade students. Um, just to get a little bit into the weeds quickly for any of my data nerds out there, um, we used a couple different cohorts of data when we looked at the elementary school outcomes. Um, so first, when looking at outcomes in the elementary years, we, used, we wanted to use the most recent data that was unaffected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we looked at data for students in grades three through eight from school year 2018-19. Um, but then when we wanted to look at later outcomes, for example, whether students went on to graduate high school or enroll in college, we needed to back up those years a bit to give students enough time um, to, to proceed through high school and into college. So for those analyses where we're looking at future outcomes, we looked at students in grades three through eight from school year 2010-11. Um, and then finally, when we look at changes in outcomes across different years, we backed it up even further so that we could look at things longitudinally across time. So for those analyses, we use data from third through eighth grade students in each school year from 2008 to nine to 2018-19. Um, and happy to take questions on those nuances um, at the end of the presentation. But again, we looked at patterns of students' attendance and GPA and how those related to later academic outcomes. Um, and our analysis really led us to draw a line at 90% attendance and at a 3.0 GPA. Um, those were really clear in the data, but they're also important cutoffs that people are already used to talking about and have been already sort of socialized um, throughout the space. So when we drew those two lines, this gave us four different groups. Um, and I'm gonna talk through those groups in a second, but I wanna note first that these are not categories we recommend using with students. We would never want students to sort of internalize that category as like a label or a judgment on them. Um, and the other thing to note is that this indicator system and the CPS system that we just looked at, they really support and complement each other. They're both really helpful as practitioners try to find ways to support students. Um, in some cases, maybe when working with individual students, schools might prefer that nuance of the CPS system. 
Um, maybe in other cases when they're looking at school-wide trends or identifying and matching students with interventions, they might prefer this system. Um, but most importantly, improving one metric would improve the other metric. Um, so again, these four groups um, that we've created, we're calling this the condensed EOT categories. Um, and to talk you briefly through these groups, I'm going to start with students here in the on track group. So these are students who have high grades above a 3.0 GPA and they have high attendance or coming to school at least 90% of the time. So generally they're doing well, they're attending school frequently, earning high grades. Um, in our sample of students that we looked at for the analysis, this was actually about 50% of students, which is great. Um, the goal broadly is to get more students into this category. And then once they're there, to engage them, challenge them, and support them so that they can stay in this on-track group. Um, next, this attendance support group in the bottom right, this is students who um, have a high GPA above a 3.0, but they're not coming to school 90% of the time or more. So this is actually a really small group. You can see here it was only about 3% of students in our sample. Um, it's pretty rare for students to not come to school that often, but have high grades. And so it's possible that some students in this group might be experiencing special circumstances like uh, maybe a prolonged sickness or unstable housing. Um, and so the key takeaway for this group is really to identify what's preventing them from coming to school more regularly and provide some focused support. Um, this next group in the upper left corner is the academic support group, because these are students who they're coming to school pretty frequently, at least 90% of the time. Um, but they don't have a 3.0 GPA. So this is actually a really large group. It's over a third of students in our sample, um, which also suggests that many schools and classrooms may also have large numbers of students that fall into this group. Again, they're coming to school regularly, but they're not earning a 3.0, which to us suggested something about the curriculum, assessment, maybe the classroom culture is not working for these students. Um, of course, their needs might not be solely academic. They, might also need support with out-of-school challenges as well, but educators may be able to make school-wide or even classroom changes in order to help these students better connect with school and have more academic success. Um, and in particular, students who are failing core classes might need a more specific or individual intervention. So the key question for this group is, how do classroom culture, instruction, assessment, or curriculum play a role in preventing these students from earning high grades? And then lastly, on the bottom left is the intensive support group. So this again is a pretty small group, less than 10% of students in the sample we looked at. And that might actually be smaller than people think. Um, these are the students who usually raise a lot of red flags and that schools really have on their radar because they're struggling with both grades and attendance. Um, they likely require more intensive interventions, maybe more personalized support. And so the key action here is identifying what the root causes behind their, these students' struggles are and what systems we have to connect them with um, for additional both in-school and out-of-school <clears throat> resources to connect them with those supports and monitor progress. So again, this is the sort of high-level indicator system that we're rolling out today and you'll see echoed again um, on our tool that Thomas is gonna walk us through in a bit. But the next question we wanted to ask ourselves in the research was, are these groups meaningful? Do they tell us something about students' later outcomes? So what were outcomes like for students in each of these EOT groups? Um, so we're gonna start with looking here at what were the high school graduation rates like for students in each of these groups? And specifically, we wanted to look at graduating high school with a 3.0 GPA, um, because we know this is an important indicator of future college persistence and completion. So we're going to start here at the bottom, looking at students in the on-track group. And if you look at all the way on the right side of the bar, it will show us um, the overall high school graduation rate for students in that group. So for students in the on-track group, they graduated high school at about 93%. Um, the two different colors in the bar, I want to focus on the dark green area. The dark green tells us the percentage of students that graduated high school with a 3.0 GPA or better. Um, and so we can see that for the on-track group, that was about 57% of students. Looking next at the intensive support group, um, so these are students that struggled in the middle grades with both attendance and GPA. And we see that only about 40% of them go on to graduate high school in four years, and only about 5% do so with a 3.0 GPA. So those struggles in the middle grades did continue into struggles in the high school years. 
looking at the attendance support group, um, they're a bit more in the middle, about 71% graduated high school in four years, but only about a third did so with a 3.0 GPA, despite having had that high GPA in the middle grades years. And then lastly, this academic support group. So again, this is the group that has um, high attendance, but doesn't have that 3.0 GPA in the middle grades. And this group, while they graduate high school um, at a rate of 72%, only 17% of them are finishing high school with a 3.0 GPA. And so this is really where we start to see that important designation. These academic support group students are coming to school just as often as the students who are on track. They just don't have that, um, that B average, that 3.0 GPA. And we can see um, really how that correlates with a much lower um, chance of finishing high school with a 3.0 GPA. Um, one other thing I want to note here is many students do move between groups. So these are in no way sort of destiny or um, a set course for students. There are certainly a lot of students in the intensive support group who do get back on track and who do graduate high school and enroll in college. Um, we're not saying these groups are predetermined or certain outcomes. Um, with the right support, students absolutely can move up between groups. So this next one, we're looking now at um, the same type of graph, but instead of looking at whether students graduate high school, we're looking at whether they enrolled in college. And so we wanted to see what immediate college enrollment rates were like for students in each of these groups. So again, looking first at students who were on track in the middle grades, um, about three quarters of them enroll into college. And the dark green bar here shows over half enrolled into a four-year college. Looking at the intensive support group, we see um, only about 16% went on to immediately enroll in college and fewer than 10% into a four-year. Students in the attendance support group, um, fewer than half enrolled immediately in college and only about a third into a four-year. And then lastly, this academic support group. Again, we see a really big difference here. Um, even though they were attending school in the middle grades just as often as the students who are on track, they ultimately fewer than half enrolled directly in college and only about 20% into a four-year college. So again, we see a real difference there in terms of future academic outcomes. The last piece of our research that I wanna take you through is looking at what these patterns look like across lines of race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, but before I do that, I wanna pause for a minute and especially um, acknowledging my positionality as a white woman and all that that means I bring to the table in the research. Um, we just wanna acknowledge as a two and through team that it can be challenging to see and discuss differences in educational outcomes by race, ethnicity, and gender. But at the same time, differences in these condensed EOT categories across lines of difference are representative of some of the differing educational opportunities and out of school challenges faced by different groups of students. So we show these differences with the hope that looking at outcomes for different groups of students can seed important conversations about educational equity. And it's also critical to state that the differences in attainment we see in the report are due to historical and ongoing oppression of people of color and the many structural barriers they face. There are many examples of students and schools overcoming these obstacles, but structural racism remains embedded in our systems. So ultimately, these data are meant to be consumed as part of a collaborative dialogue about the inequitable policies, systems, and practices that prevent too many Black and Latinx CPS students from reaching their academic potential. So while students and families must be at the table to achieve equitable elementary and middle grades learning experiences, the responsibility for change must lie with the adults and the institutions in Chicago. So having said that, um, this first figure shows the distribution of students from different race, ethnicity, and gender groups into the four different condensed EOT categories. So for example, all the way on the left, we see um, the green portion of the bar is students who are in the on-track group. So for Asian American Pacific Islander girls, that was um, a very large portion. The blue portion shows students who are the, in the attendance support group, orange is academic support, and red is intensive support. So what we can see is that within each race ethnicity group, boy, boys were less likely to be in the on-track category than girls, and they were more likely than girls to be in the academic support or intensive support categories. Um, additionally, more than half of Black boys and almost half of Latino boys or we're in the academic support group, meaning that they came to school 90% of the time, but still didn't have that 3.0. Um, and that suggests something about their experiences inside of schools and classrooms may not always be successfully driving their learning. 
it's also important on the other hand to look at the numbers of students. And so many black and Latino boys are having academic success. In this cohort that we're looking at in the 2018-19 school year, there were more than 7,000 black boys and 14,000 Latino boys who were on track. Next, we're gonna focus on comparing outcomes for students who were in the same EOT category. So we're focusing here on the on-track group, um, but these patterns held as well for the other three groups. So this first graph is showing us the percent of on-track students graduating high school with above or below a 3.0 GPA, looking at these different race, ethnicity, and gender groups. Um, so what we see here is while all of these students were in the on-track group in the middle grades, they still have differing outcomes um, when it comes to graduating high school and their GPAs at high school graduation. Um, looking at these top level numbers, we can see that these students were all on track in the middle grades and they all graduated from high school at pretty high rates. But we see some pretty big disparities in terms of whether they had a above or below a 3.0 GPA at high school graduation. And then similarly, now we're looking at the outcome of immediate college enrollment. Um, and again, we see pretty high rates of enrolling in college, but differences in whether students enrolled into four-year or two-year, and actually some bigger differences here in just the outcome itself of whether they enrolled in college. So the key takeaway here is even within EOT groups, even for example, among all students who were on track in the middle grades, there are still disparities in outcomes, meaning there are still far more barriers for black and Latino students than there are for other groups of students. Um, and again, we know this is due to structural racism and other issues within the system rather than the abilities of students themselves. But there is more work high schools need to do to ensure that students who are successful in elementary school continue to be successful in high school, no matter which race, ethnicity, or gender group they come from. And then lastly, I just wanted to um, preview a couple of the resources that we have accompanying their report for practitioners. The first one that you can find on our website alongside the report is a one-pager um, practitioner guide. So you'll see this is a front and back here that we have here on the left and right. Um, and it goes through those same four categories that I talked through, um, has some just key data and facts, and then on the, on the back are key questions for actions, um, as well as a little preview of the tools that we have on offer. Um, and speaking of the tools, so in a minute, Thomas is gonna walk us through our public online tool, which is on our website um, and is available to anyone. We also have a tool that we created for our middle grades network schools specifically, um, as Ashley mentioned in the beginning, that cohort of schools that we work directly with. This is just a snapshot. The tool is in um, Google Sheets and it helps schools take um, all, that all that data that it's available on GPA and attendance for their, for their students and um, provides both student lists and these kind of overview high level snapshots of the school as a whole to help identify trends and look for patterns and where students might need support or, um, or celebrating. So if people are interested in that tool, I believe we've got a link we can drop to a Google form to fill out to gain access to that tool. Um, but Thomas is now gonna walk us through our public tool that's available on our website for anyone to use and hopefully is useful to all of you. So I will turn it over to Thomas. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Alex, for um, yeah presenting some of that research. And thank you again, Ashley, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into um, this tool that we've developed um, for um, using the condensed EOT categories, which um, Alex has just described, in practice um, at your school um, or at the schools in your community. So. Um, Let's start off by just giving a general overview of the different, um, different milestones that we have on this page. So as you can see, um, we have here sixth grade enrollment all the way up until college enrollment. And so for your given elementary school in CPS, you can see um, what enrollment looks like in the sixth, in the sixth grade. Then you can see um, what your condensed EOT categories are like at your school. And I'll go into more depth on this. Um, in a minute. And then you can also see how the students from your elementary school progress into um, high school and where they're attending high school. You can see how they are doing in terms of um, the high school indicator freshman on track, which we know is important for um, both high school graduation, college enrollment, and other outcomes. 
And then you can also see rates of high school graduation and as well as college enrollment. And um, importantly, you'll also see that um, we include disaggregations um, of these values for uh, the students from your elementary school also related to um, how they were doing in middle school. So um, you'll, get, you'll get a chance to do some of this validation at your own school of the condensed EOT categories and their usefulness. Um, so I'll also start by saying, um, and, I'll, and I'll reiterate this later, all of the data that we'll be showing here today is, and specifically on this tool, is in reference to um, two-year aggregated outcome, two-year aggregated um, data points. And um, so as you'll see here, for example, we're showing sixth graders enrolled in CPS in school year 20 and school year 21. So um, all of our data represents this two-year combined outcome because there are smaller schools in our data set um, for which we wanted to um, keep the privacy of students when we're disaggregating into smaller groups. So just a note there in terms of interpreting some of these outcomes. Okay, so one important feature um, I want to bring to light here on this main landing page for um, this elementary lens of our data tool is the filter. So here you can see you have access to all of the data for um, different elementary schools in TPS and you can actually filter to say, um, maybe I only want to look at students with a certain um, demographic percentage, or um, you only want to look at students um, within a certain network in CPS. Then you can also um, filter in terms of the enrollment, um, so the largest or the smallest enrollment, um, or any of these other milestone categories. So if you wanted to um, look at the schools with the highest high school enrollment, um, that's currently the, the order it would be in now. And then you could look at also students from the lowest high school enrollment on out. So um, for the purpose of today's demo, we'll take a look at Hernandez. So you can use this find your school um, option to um, type in the name of your school and get into that school's data. So. Um, also, thank you to Hernandez again for um, agreeing to uh, allow us to use your data for um, a presentation today. So thank you. Okay, so once you click into a school, you'll see that um, you have first a list of similar schools to compare to Hernandez. And this is really just to get an understanding of um, how Hernandez is doing to compare to schools that um, are similar in terms of um, major just demographic categories, school size, um, and other academic outcomes. Now, um, for today's presentation, um, I'll be getting more into the um, sixth to eighth grade condensed EOT milestone, the, the high school enrollment milestone, and then the college enrollment milestone. But I do encourage you all to check out the other milestones, which I don't get into today, um, because there is a lot of interesting data there, which is worth you all looking at. So um, getting first into the sixth to eighth grade condensed EOT milestone, you'll see here that um, you can see the breakdown of the condensed EOT categories, the proportions of students in each of these categories for your given school. So not only can you do that, you can also see how those categories compared to um, the proportions of students in these categories across CPS overall. So here you can see, okay, for students at Hernandez in this two year aggregate um, uh, time frame, you can see that 35% of students were on track. And in that same time frame, you see that 45 percent students were on track in CPS overall as a point of comparison. Um, and you can not only do this for sixth to eighth grade, you can also look specifically just at sixth grade, or you can look at seventh grade, eighth grade, or um, like we had started out with sixth to eighth grade combined. And similarly, you can see not just how students are doing in the most recent year, but you can see how um, these outcomes have changed over time. So um, here you can see for each of these two year times time frames, um, you're seeing how students we're doing in terms of the proportion of students in each of these condensed EOT categories, which um, Alex had just given you all the research background for. You can see how those change over time. 
And again, you can filter that by different grade levels. And then at the bottom of each page, you'll see that um, you can also disaggregate into um, different demographic groups and their outcomes. So um, here you can see that uh, we're looking at the condensed EOT categories um, for boys and girls. So first you're just seeing a percentage of students that were in the on-track category. Um, and you can compare that to CPS, but also the comparison schools that I had mentioned to you previously. And then you can see um, if you hit this across years tab, you can see how specifically boys are doing over time at Hernandez compared to um, girls over time. And this applies not just to the a gender breakdown, but you can also do this for race. And you can also do this um, for race and gender. So specifically looking at um, you know, comparing Latino boys to black boys or Latina girls in this case. Um, okay, so now let's get into the high school enrollment page. So here you can see that um, you, you can see the number of students from Hernandez, so the number of eighth grade graduates who go on to attend CPS high schools. Um, and so first you'll see a breakdown of the types of high schools that students are attending um, in this two year frame. So, and, and you can compare that similarly to, as you saw on our last page, you can compare that breakdown to CPS overall. So um, here, as you can see, Hernandez, most of the students are attending their assigned neighborhood school um, at, and as you can see it also just at a higher rate compared to CPS overall. And then one unique feature of this page is that you can also, instead of just seeing the types of high schools in these broader categories, you can get a clear understanding of um, the high schools themselves. So in this top five table, you can see, okay, where are students from Fernandez actually going to school? What are the names of those high schools? And um, so here you can see that most students from Hernandez in this time frame attended Solario High School. And an important feature here is that you can actually then click into Solario High School, and this will take you to the data for our high school tool, which you might be aware of from previous presentations, um, show similar data, but instead um, on high, in the high school lens for um, data on students from Solario or any other given high school at CPS from freshman enrollment to college completion. But getting back into this elementary school tool, um, yes, so you see this top five page. Um, then you also can see high school enrollment trends over time. And then you can also, similarly as to, as to how I had shown you for the CPS um, EOT categories page, um, you can also see, um, or sorry, the condensed EOT categories page, you can also see um, high school enrollment trends broken down um, into different race and gender groups um, or different demographic groups. So here you can see enrollment trends for boys and girls. And you, also, you can also do that by race and by gender and look at those um, demographic trends over time when there is enough data available. And then finally, um, I'll finish off by showing you all the college enrollment page. Here you can see um, the number of students, the trends for students who um, graduated from Hernandez um, in eighth grade. So they attended, C they attended Hernandez in eighth grade, and then they did not leave, uh, they did not transfer out of CPS um, at some point before, at some point um, before four years after they graduated um, Hernandez in eighth grade. So you can think of the students on this page are the students who did not transfer out of CPS. And so that's who we're looking at here. Um, and so specifically what we're showing here is the number of students who either immediately enrolled in a four-year college, um, students who immediately enrolled in a two-year college, or students who did not immediately enroll. And then um, we also, just as a point of context, even though it's not shown in this breakdown, um, we also give uh, a gist for people, the percentage of students who transfer out of CPS um, sometime, in some time in the four years after their eighth grade graduation. You can compare that to CPS broadly as well. So again, here you can compare um, Hernandez's rates to CPS overall as a point of comparison. And we also give um, a top five category for, um, similar to how we had done for high school enrollment, we show the top five most commonly attended colleges 
um, for Hernandez students, Hernandez graduates, I should say. Um, and you can see not just the top five overall, but you can see the top five four-year colleges specifically, or the top five two-year colleges um, for any given school. And then, of course, um, as I had shown you, for any given page, you'll see that data over time. So how are those college enrollment trends doing um, uh, as you know, time progresses um, in these two-year intervals, as I've described? And then, again, you can see um, how your students are doing in these different demographic groups. And most importantly, uh, or not most, but just another facet of how you can look into this data is you can actually um, see based on how students were doing in terms of these condensed EOT categories, um, how, are, how did students end up enrolling in college? So um, that's currently what you're seeing on this page. So um, you can see that for the on-track students, so students that were on track in eighth grade at Hernandez, you can see that um, the 62% of them immediately enrolled in a two or four year college. And you can compare that to um, students in the other condensed EOT categories. So this is really a way of um, doing some kind of internal validation of the condensed EOT categories for you at your given school. Um, so uh, it's a way to really see how these um, categories can be useful for you and how they're relevant for students um, beyond just the middle school, the middle, the middle grades years. So that those sixth to eighth grade um, years. And then of course you can also see um, the gender and race and gender breakdowns as well for these outcomes. So if you were interested in seeing how, um, you know, your different demographic groups, as like Latino boys or Latino girls, and comparing those um, into in terms of how um, they how often they immediately enrolled in college, um, you can also see that here, and you can also see that broken down into two year and four year over time. So um, this concludes my um, brief overview of the tool, um, and yeah, I really encourage you all to um, check out uh, these other pages that I didn't get to today. Um, but thank you. I'll go ahead and um, hand it back off to uh, Ashley now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you for walking us through the tool. Um, and thank you again to Alex for walking us through all the research behind the tool and all the great insights that you guys have gleaned from, from doing this work and research over the last couple of years. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of um, the webinar. So if you have not already, please feel free to throw any of your questions into Q&A. We've had a, uh, quite a few technical questions come up in the Q&A, so we've been answering those kind of throughout the presentation. But if you have something you'd like us to surface, um, please feel free to add it now. I'm actually gonna start with a question that was already submitted, um, and either of you can feel free to answer. What does it mean that the fraction of middle grade students on track is so much lower than the fraction of ninth grade students who are on track? Um, I think there's, a couple different factors at play. So they are different metrics, um, meaning just that they take different things into account. For example, FOT, um, which is the freshman on track rate for those not familiar with the CPS context, um, the one of the big metrics used in the freshman year, um, that doesn't take attendance into account. Um, so in that way, um, the elementary, the condensed on track that we're using is almost a higher bar. It takes the attendance into account and it looks for a 3.0 GPA, whereas FOT just looks at um, basically non-failures. Um, and I think that we did that, well, I talked to you a lot of the reasons why we picked the 90% and the 3.0 GPA, but um, another important thing to know is just that um, two and three released a report called Hidden Risk a few years ago um, that showed that GPAs tend to decline across all different types of students and actually more so for students that were really successful in the middle grades, um, GPAs decline during the transition to high school. And so um, setting the bar a bit higher with EOT takes some of that into account. Um, I would also say it's just a great marker of all the wonderful work being done in high schools across the city around the FOT metric and um, how much work schools are doing to get freshmen on track and their, yeah, students on track in their freshman year, I should say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, another question we can talk about, and again, please feel free to add other questions into the Q&A box as they come up for you. 
What additional findings did you have in relation to the brief that didn't make it into this presentation or the report that folks might find interesting? Yes, so um, I think one important thing which we looked at, which you'll find in the appendix of the EOT um, report, which, we, which we've just released, is that we looked at how these condensed EOT categories changed over time. So um, Alex had mentioned in the research overview that we looked at students from the 2008 to 2009 school year all the way up until the 2018 2019 school year and we looked at how um, the proportions of students in these categories changed and um, an important finding here was that the category the number of students in these categories did change um, and with that and we saw that you know specifically the number of on-track students really increased which is really suggesting that there could be some significant progress that's happening um, in CPS elementary schools, which is to say there's, um, while there's still room for improvement, um, we know that Im improvement is possible and um, that these are not categories that are just set in stone for students or for schools. Um, so um, I think that's, that's really one thing to uh, mention. Alex, anything to add from your perspective? Um, no, I think that was a great answer. Tom. Wonderful. Um, so part of what you all both mentioned kind of in both the tool overview and the research overview is that this tool, the, this research is really designed to help practitioners use this data differently and really help them kind of shift their practice. So how might schools think about customizing their use of the condensed EOT, EOT grid for their own purposes? How might practitioners actually use this tool in their day-to-day -day work? Yeah, I think our hope is that it's, not intimidating, that it's easy to remember it's 3.0 and 90%. Um, and that people can kind of just keep that in their in the back of their head and not even necessarily feel a need, you know, if you're not like super data savvy or if you um, don't need like another tool on your in your toolkit at the moment, um, you can just kind of have that as a framework for when you're looking at um, students or looking at grades or looking at attendance patterns to just kind of keep those two um, those two like lines in the sand as being really important markers. Um, but for schools that are looking for something a little bit more um, in the weeds or that have time to do some, or maybe are really interested in doing some data analysis, um, I don't, you don't even have to be in the Chicago context. I think any schools that have data available on students' attendance rates or students' grades, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy tool. It can just be um, a way that you organize your data. Let's group all the students, you know, with these um, who fall into these categories together, um, whether or not you use a spreadsheet or um, something more, you know, it could be just as simple as um, a way that you organize your notes on students um, to use that framework. Um, and then for students that are for schools that are ready for maybe the next level, um, feel free to um, follow the link that we dropped in chat and we are happy to share that more customized tool with you um, or use our public online tool. Wonderful. We got a follow up question. Um, and it says, can you say more about how the use of these measures and tools is being supported and or guided in CPS schools and networks? And what are some examples of actions practitioners have taken to improve student outcomes based on this metric? Um, Ashley, I might let you talk a little bit about the Drake case. Um, as a, that's a really cool example of how a school has been using the condensed EOT categories. Um, in terms of how the measures are supported and guided in CPS schools and networks, um, I talked about the CPS on track grid, which came out a few years ago. Um, I don't want to speak for the district or for anyone there, but I know um, that that has been pretty widespread. I think most CPS elementary schools are familiar with it. Um, I think anyone from administrators to educators to counselors, I've heard talk about using it. Um, I know some schools use it when they're sitting down and having either grade level um, based meetings or maybe the ILT team might look at data through that lens or even the MTSS team. Um, I know the district provides a lot of data both on the dashboard system and also in um, reports that schools get every five weeks with the data organized into the EOT categories. So I know it's um, pretty well supported across the district. Wonderful, yes. And I am happy to talk a little bit of a more specific example as well. Um, so to Alex's point, one of the schools we work with in the middle grades network, Drake Elementary School, um, used these condensed EOT categories to help them kind of target some interventions for um, their students um, at the end of last school year. So specifically, 
they did one-on-one -on -one conferences with all of their students, but they decided that kind of coming into the end of the year, because some of the promotion grades, um, sixth and eighth, um, were really important. And if you fail those grades in CPS, you have to repeat that grade level. They wanted to obviously avoid that case for their students. Um, they used uh, this tool to identify all of the students who were in that academic support category and had an additional conference, one-on-one -on -one conference with those students. And that allowed them to kind of specifically talk about what are the supports we can provide you to help you get caught up before the end of the year so that you're not in danger of failings. You can you know, follow along with your classmates to the next grade level. You don't have to do summer school. Um, and they really did um, find some effectiveness with that. They actually saw quite an improvement in their on-track rates after doing those conferences across all of their students, but also did see some positive outcomes specifically for the students in the academic support category who got that extra conference as well. So that's just one example. We actually have a lot of great examples like that um, from the middle grades network and are in process of kind of capturing the learnings from schools in our first cohort and we'll be publishing those um, in the next few weeks as well. So also some more to come on, on how we've been using it in the middle grades network that might be helpful to other educators as well. All right, I think um, we have one more question, but if folks, again, have anything else they wanna add, because um, I think we have time for this and maybe one more question before we close. Could you say a little bit more about the Google tool sheet you designed? How does it work and when can uh, students use it? Or when can it be used with students, excuse me? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know that we would ever intend it to be used student facing. Um, again, we don't want students to you know, see these categories as like labels or um, predetermined um, sort of trajectories for them, but we do hope that schools use it when looking at student data. Um, so that Google tool is, um, shout out to Ella Marrero and her team who's done an amazing job of designing that in Google Sheets. Um, it is, it works with two, currently two extracts out of the CPS dashboard system um, that schools can download and then copy and paste into the back end of the tool. And it populates a few different things, a list of students with their um, quarterly grades, their cumulative grades, their GPA, their attendance, and which um, on-track category they're in, and then a high-level summary page, which is the snapshot that I showed during the presentation um, that has different charts and graphs to help schools understand sort of high-level trends and um, look for areas either for different student groups or grade levels that might need more support. Um, and it's intended to be used every, at least every five weeks when grades are updated, but could be used more frequently, really as often as your grades are updated in your school or as often as your sort of data processes and cycles in your school would allow. Well, I want to just thank you both once again um, for sharing about the research, about the tool, all the amazing work that has gone into this. Um, it's really exciting to be able to kind of see some of these outcomes long term, again, kind of using the middle grades network as a reference point. This is data that our schools have had access to for a couple of years now. But I think it's really exciting that elementary schools across the district will be able to kind of make those connections between what they're doing now for their middle school students and how that kind of um, leads to their success in high school and beyond. And being able to have some of that data, I think will be really powerful for how educators to continue to develop their practice and support, support students um, in the middle grades. So as we close out, I just want to remind everyone um, about the discussion that's gonna be happening as soon as we hop off of this. Um, so please um, join us. If you signed up for the webinar, you already got um, an invitation. If not, please feel free to click the Zoom link that my colleague Jessica just put in the chat and just head over there to join us. It's a very casual discussion, um, just to kind of talk through and process what you heard today. We also always record these sessions. So you will be able to see um, this on our YouTube channel after the event as well, um, if you wanna share it or um, kind of promote the, the tool and the report with others who you think might find it useful. So thank you all once again, it was really a pleasure to have you. Thank you again to Alex and Thomas for sharing um, and presenting about this great research and tool. Um, I love working with you guys and I'm excited that after all the hard work, it's finally kind of come to fruition and it's out in the world. So thank you all so much. And we hope to see you at the post event discussion in a new Zoom room in a moment. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Ashley. Ashley, and thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>